All right. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining us again this week. You're tuning in to Skane's Domain with Wynton Marsalis, and I'm Adam Meeks, your technical host for the evening. Tonight, we're joined by members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, including Chris Crenshaw, Kenny Rampton, Elliot Mason, Camille Thurman, Ted Nash, Paul Nedzella, Walter Blanding, Dan Nimmer, and Carlos Enriquez. If you have a question you'd like to ask, we will have you use the raise hand feature. To do this, click participants on the bottom of your Zoom window, and then in the participants tab, press the raise hand button. Um, please also just make sure that um, your full name appears as your username so we can call on you when it's your turn. Um, and before we do that, I'd like to hand the mic over to Mr. Winton Marsalis to kick things off. Go ahead, Winton. All right, thank you very much, Adam. Welcome everybody back again this week for Skane's Domain where we discuss issues significant and trivial. And the more trivial they are, the more we, more impassioned we are about it. Today I have the blessing of, ha of having the members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. I miss them so much. And we spent so many times, so many years playing each other's music on bandstands for our younger members. Some started as students, for our older members, we've been here. And uh, I just want, I also want to hear from them. We were talking and laughing and joking before we opened the lines up. So we're going to just open to a few questions and we're going to get into just a free conversation. Feel free to have questions for any of us and we'd love to answer it. I'm going to mm -hmm. start with our senior member, Mr. Ted Nash, because when you get to a certain age, everybody thinks you know something. You, they always ask you for, the, for advice. So I want him to tell us how COVID-19 has affected him and what advice does he have for all of us for preparing for life post-COVID-19, if, if there's ever a post-COVID. You're just calling on me because I'm old because you're afraid I'm going to die before this call is over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get through this fast. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a good one. Uh, you know, this is, <laughs> I, I, it's really more about like moving forward. I mean, I feel like this is a tough time. I mean, whenever we have a time of extreme challenge or, or crisis, there's always an opportunity for growth. There's always an opportunity. We need to prepare for this and we need to be practical, but we also need to deal with it psychologically and emotionally. And uh, I know people, people are struggling right now. They're struggling with how to find inspiration. Um, they're looking for ways to continue to be creative and active. And um, I think that moving forward, is going to be about adapting. We have to be intelligent and, and creative. We have to we have to really be intelligent and creative about how we move forward past all of this. It's it's going to be tough. I know politics is going to need to be net less partisan, and that is absolutely for sure. We need to find a way to be less partisan with our politics. Our country and our world needs to take better care of of its citizens with more comprehensive health programs, more job protection. I think. Education, when I think about everything, education is absolutely the priority. We have to start educating and exposing kids when they're young to what, what is it, what's the world like? I mean, you can sometimes understand how kids grow up in a vacuum and they don't know what's happening out here. And I think we need to, we need to vet our teachers. We need, to make, we need to make education and teaching, like being a doctor or a lawyer, lawyer you know, you have, to, you have to study for a long time and be really good at it and get paid well for it. I think education is the key. Um, I think absolutely an overhaul of our, our police system is, is, is necessary. Um, but the United States needs to figure out a way to, uh, to embrace cultures from all over the world. I mean, this is, this is absolutely important. We are, it's hard to even see it sometimes, but I, I really do think it's, a, it's an opportunity. It's always an opportunity when we're in this kind of crisis, and it's a shame to overlook it at this point. I know if you look at post 9-11, I know there's some, probably some people out there that don't really remember that as, as well, but the political polarization that began in the 1990s continued to get worse after that. And the economic inequality that began in the 1980s also continued to get worse through that. You know, nobody asked us to rally to become a more aware, more engaged. I mean, our civic equity was completely squandered at that time. We had an opportunity, flag sales, went through the roof because our leaders basically said, go out, be consumers, spend money, go out and spend money. I mean, anyone could buy a flag, but clearly 9-11 did not really change the world. It, it accelerated our pre-existing trends. And I think that we're in that kind of position now that we have to recognize that that's also a possibility and we have to fight against that. 
Um, I mean, that's, I think what we needed after 9-11 was better leadership. And, uh, and clearly now we're struggling in that area. So I just think that we do have an opportunity, but we need to work hard. And uh, that, I mean. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you a question because it's, yeah. easy, it's, it's easy to call for all of what we need. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna liken it to the bandstand. You're a person who's very good at <clears throat> adapting music from different cultures. You're able to understand what kind of the, the, the feeling or the essence of what something is. And you also, when we're rehearsing your music, you're very good at not trying to force people to do something that they don't necessarily want to do, but still get the sound that you want. So without going too long, just, just on you, I want, I want you to touch on something tangible about what makes you able to be successful listening to other cultures' music and get in the orbit of their sound. And then how are you able to let people who may have a different concept from you play their concept and still find space under your umbrella for what they're doing? Well, it's interesting you say that because I feel sometimes I'm a little too easy on people when I rehearse. I know sometimes when I rehearse, you jump in and say, hey man, we got to get that together more or whatever. <laughs> I know I'm like that. I'm very That's like- Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> That's Carlos. That's Carlos or Walter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Walter's I, always turned one turn it around, saying, "Do y'all hear how this sounds?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, sometimes I wish I were a little more clear about what I want, and sometimes I just think that I, I take for granted that everybody's going to basically understand what I want. I don't have to force it down them, down their throats. And I think that a lot of that's my upbringing. It's like when Andre Guest told me to embrace your mythology, right? Embrace who you are. I think about my parents and how laid back they were, and I think that's had a huge impact on me. So even though I do like to explore all these different cultures, I'm not trying to, I remember we did that whole program with the fl flamenco music, I think it was, and we were talking uh -huh. about Big 12. That's right. Man, you dealt, you, you took that music and you, you studied it so hard intellectually. <laughs> you were saying, we got to rehearse this stuff, we got to get this feel together. And I had to write a piece for that. And I just kind of in intuitively wrote this piece of music that sounded sort of flamenco-ish and brought it in and we played it but I didn't have that kind of research that you had. And I feel like <clears throat> there's, there's a place for really understanding deeply the cultures that you're trying to bring into your music and not disrespect it. Carlos definitely can talk about that because we do so much Latin and jazz mix kind of stuff like that. And, and uh, it, it's challenging sometimes to feel like you know enough about this to make people play it. But I, I'm kind of more laid back. So I don't know, maybe that's something I need to work on you know, when I'm playing. Well, I don't know. Your piece sounded a lot better than mine. Me and Carlos, <laughs> <laughs> that's just the truth. Carlos and I were looking at a book, we're on a plane. You remember this, Carlos? We looked yeah, at the yeah. book, and we just studied and studied it. Yeah. <laughs> Carlos said, who wrote this book? He said, you see, yeah. <laughs> all, the, <laughs> all the information was wrong. So I don't know about that, <laughs> you know? Oh my God, yeah. So but I, I, wanna, I wanna go in, in another, I'm gonna just go over to Chris. And I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to, we have, cause, cause we're all here, you know, we have so many experiences we can share with people. I want to see if Chris can remember uh, an unforgettable moment that we've had on the bandstand that can be, that can be shared on air. But <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Man, that's not fun. Man. <laughs> Open it up. But you know, I, I can think of two instances actually. Uh, one of them was when Bobby Hutchison um, played in your own sweet way. That's right, he made us cry. Yeah. We all had tears in our eyes. Bro, I'm talking about, not, not to make a pun, but he was playing, he had such a vibe when he played, <laughs> and he played so much Amen. vibe. I mean, it was like, it was like, it was, you knew, it was almost like you knew it was his last time. Last time. And he, that you all guy, remember that? That was NEA, right? Wasn't that the NEA? It was the NEA Jazz yeah. Masters. Yeah. And he, right. and he came out everyone there. was crying. Everyone That's was right. crying. I'm talking. I wanted to take a standing ovation after he made it, did his solo. Man, it was yeah. it was that unbelievable, bro. I, I started right. to do it, but you know that's that's one of those moments that you're on the band. And it's like, man, you just never forget that. And then that's another right. moment that I could think of, uh, uh, I could I could do it in two words: Eartha Kit. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You remember that? Man. <laughs> hey, Sugar was, Rob. Sugar Rob in here. Where yeah, are you? exactly. It was 2007. Mm. It was um, it was a concert where we had Paul Anchor, Fantasia, and Eartha Kitt. Oh, and it was a sound check. It wasn't necessarily the gig. It was the sound check. Chris, you, know, you remember the stretching she was doing? That's what I'm about to get into. She was stretching. You know, she was purring. She was doing her thing, getting ready. And 
Man, Sugar Rob was was smiling like a Cheshire cat, bro. <laughs> Wipe the smile off his face, man. I'm oh my God. And then she one. started singing Santa Baby, and yeah, it got baby. bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Chris, hey. you remember when Bobby was at the softball game in uh, San Francisco? Yeah, that's the one. Bobby Hutchinson came with his oxygen tank because his yeah. son was playing right. with, with the SF Jazz crew, and he yeah. stood in the in the bleachers and just hung with us. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that was fun, man. Skane came up, hit a home yeah. run, and left. He hit a home run and left. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, what about let me? Do y'all remember that that Misty that uh that Diane Reeves put Ooh, on us? Yes. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. Talk yeah, about that was one Friday night. Whew. Yep. Don't forget that. <laughs> That's right. It was Friday night, it too. It was a Friday night, too. Her and Peter Martin were, yep. were on stage, and they did Misty, and it was like it was never going to end, but you didn't want to end because it got into that moment where it was just spontaneity on top yeah, of spontaneity. It was, it was spiritual, man, right there. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Show you right. Well, you know, I want to I wanna ask Elliot something. You know, your wife, Sophia, is a great singer, and your son... Maxim, he's going to be in the trumpet section one day, like his uncle and his grandfather. <laughs> yeah, before, yeah, before he's a bass player. <laughs> bass trumpet. No, no, bass no, trumpet. no bass. He's going to play a bass and make some money. Come on. <laughs> Actually, he's on drums you... right now. He's, he's digging drums. That's yeah. close enough. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that Drums right next to trumpet. So, <laughs> so, Elliot, how are you staying motivated and inspired when there's no, no gigs mm -hmm. around? And also, when we look into the future, we don't see a gig anywhere. We, yeah, yeah, that that's the tough thing right there. But um, you know, I think in general, which is we're, we're all trying to do what we love in any capacity possible, and you know, as a musician, that human reaction that we have on stage and the intimacy and the feeling, I mean, you just can't you can't match that. So I've been trying to make like little adjustments with the things that I can kind of control to try and make up with that with that huge uh, loss of that actual live performance. And I'm, mm -hmm. definitely, I'm definitely missing, you know, you guys right now on stage <laughs> right. and being on stage. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of music. I mean, I always kind of listen to music, but now I'm like getting deeper, maybe more into like emotional listening. And, and uh -huh. I know you were talking about, Winton was talking about Monk last week and how you were kind of revisiting some of that stuff. And that's, that's yeah. kind of like, there's always music like that on, on in my house right now. And, and speaking mm -hmm. of Maxim, like he's calling stuff out, like he's, He's on a Brazilian kick right now. He wants me to put that on. He's like dancing all around the, the house the whole time. So he, he actually controls. He has the remote. He's controlling the music all the time. How old, How old is he now? How old is Max? He's two and a half. He's That's two and it. a half right now. He got perfect pitch? Actually, he's he's got some crazy ears. I don't even know what's going on there. Like yeah, Next to actually, daddy. Right. He like his he's dad. Got some crazy ears. Daddy he's got, got it. Crazy ears. <laughs> I mean, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about him as well at the end there. But, um, but you know, I mean, also I feel like, our, you know, as musicians, sometimes that live performance is our creative outlet. And so I'm making sure that I'm trying to be creative in my practice as well. And that's keeping me... I'm enjoying all these live stream concerts. I know like everyone and their uncle is doing one. But at the same time, it's kind of fun to... You know, I'm seeing people that maybe I wouldn't get to see. And on the other end of it, as being like a performer is kind of giving me something to work towards and these little goals that kind of help everything else fall in line, like more of a purpose within my practice. Um, virtual collaborations are like have been crazy as well, which I think is like is wonderful. I'm like getting reached out and also reaching out to people maybe I've never played with before. Uh -huh. but, um, and, and just having some kind of reaction, I mean, some kind of connection and play with, with 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 some people that I, I didn't even think I'd even get to play with um so so that that's been a lot of the stuff that's keeping keeping me keeping me inspired I mean I also think there's like as a as a jazz musician staying motivated and inspired when you only have three gigs in your book is something that we, <laughs> is actually all too familiar to us right you know, definitely at some point we've true, been there true. you know we right. can relate right. so yeah. there's, there's a sense uh. of that and <laughs> I mean, obviously, That's there's. So you know, for real, man. I'm not trying to make you know light of it. I mean, obviously, there's there's, there's like an unsettling uncertainty or whatever hanging over everything. But I think you can either go two ways. You can curl up into a ball and you can kind of wait for things to end, or you can like double down on like what you do and 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 become stronger on the other end of it. And that's something that I feel like has really uh, motivated me. Um, 
<clears throat> is just, just, just really trying to just almost double down on, on, on practicing and listening and everything. So, so when we do get to have our concerts, that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm more positive and I'm in a better place than I was beforehand. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're going to be back to being the two who play on the fast tunes all the time. Well, yeah, there's, there's that. I'm, you know, I'm just going to quickly going to tell you about that Maxim story, right? So we were recording Chris's tune and I was in this room right now. Uh -huh. And, um, and I, you know, we have the camera set up, I've got my shirt on, you know, I'm halfway <laughs> through the tune, everything's, you know, I feel like it's a good take. And that door opens <laughs> and suddenly he comes running in, and, you know, like for the first few seconds, I'm thinking I can still salvage this. You know, this is pretty cute. I'll pick him up on my lap and everything and we'll still be able to use this take. <laughs> and of course, he's just come out the bath. He's got like zero clothes on whatsoever. So it's like, now I'm looking there going like, and uh, nah, this is our <laughs> I, I got to do another take right now. So, you know, when you're looking at those, you know, things that we're doing, the big band, there's a lot that goes on behind oh, yeah. the scenes. It's right. I oh. hear Dan like co signing me right now. But, you know, when you've got kids and you're trying to record in a room and it's like, it's, it, it's a challenge, but, it, but it's, it, all you can do is, is, is just enjoy it, you know. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead, go ahead with the, with the Nimsky. Dan, what are, the, what are some of the things that you miss the most about being able to, to perform live? Because, you know, you, you, you a diehard swing. Thanks, Winnie. Man, I miss everyone's sound, man. Like the, the vibration of their sound, mm -hmm. being able to hear them in a room, being mm -hmm. able to hear the sound bounce off the walls right. of, a, of a concert hall, of a stage. You know, that's, that's for real. No matter how good your Wi-Fi is, how good your headphones are, you know, you're not going to be able to replace that live. That <laughs> That's right. I mean, I'm serious, man. Like we have all this tech. <laughs> we have all this technology, but we got it. You know, the, the live experience is the is the. So you gonna be less hard on us in rehearsals That's when we right. get back to rehearsals? We gonna be more like, okay, man, that was good. <laughs> oh man. When are you gonna do your first big band arrangement? Yeah, I did it already. I did it. Quarantine blues. I miss everyone's sound. I miss, I miss being able to interact with the musicians. You know, our, our music requires all kinds of interaction, decision-making, you know, we can't really do that now. So I, I right. miss all that kind of stuff. Well, what do you think the first gigs are going to be like after this quarantine is over? Like if you imagine you, 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 you can play in a trio or you can play alone, you can play a duo. So you're going to be out there as soon as it's an opportunity. Yeah. But what do you, what do you envision? Well, I mean, I think for the audience, it's, it's going to be, for, for everyone, it's going to be great. But for the audiences, it's going to be fresh and, you know, something new. But for us as musicians, I, I think that feeling of it being like fresh and new, of course, the first few times is going to wear off. And it's just going to be reassuring that, you know, this is what we've trained our whole lives to be doing. You know, this is what we're meant to be. This is our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's going to, they're going to be great mm -hmm. gigs. But, yeah, but do you, what do you, mm-hmm. So are you are you putting all concerts for your kids in there? Yeah, every day. <laughs> I want to see day. what they what they're talking about. Y'all playing together? What are y'all doing? Yeah. yeah, we're doing. We got a few tunes that we're doing. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I missed that. Okay, a tune. Go on. Yeah, we played. Yeah, we did. Uh, with uh, with our Milton, the Holanda, we did. We just did. Carlos and I did a tune. I, I heard it, man. It sounds yeah. great. We're gonna put, we got to put that up. That's yeah, fantastic. Sure. But um, what's the, what's the name my, of that tune? What's called, the name of the tune? Oh, Faro Kino, Kino's Gear. El Ofaro que nos guía, yeah. guiding light. Our, our guiding light. Our guiding light. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, Carlos, uh, you recording a lot from home. Y'all just did the, the trio song, and I, I butchered one of your songs a couple last week. But Ugh. yesterday I saw a beautiful picture of you with your three sons, age 15, 13, and 6. Uh -huh. And y'all all had on y'all cute Father's Day shirts. Um, how has being home so much impacted your life with your kids? Because I know they've never seen you this much. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, during the, the summers, we're usually on the road working. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough on me because, you know, being being a musician that I am, you know, I, I still I want to play. You know, I, I miss the stage. I miss hanging out. I miss that part, you know, that that's that's in me. But the one thing that I could tell you about this whole pandemic and the blessing on it is I actually get to see my kids grow and I get to see them do things that I, you know, I don't, I don't remember, you know, like these, these guys, you know, my big boy, Kiko, he's, he's 15. He's a man already, man. He's, he's big two. too. <laughs> man, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, he's man, how, how I'm going to handle him. And then Alex is 13. <laughs> he's 6'1". 
and uh, right. uh, little Joshy, you know, he's growing up. It's uh, it's been interesting, and uh, but it's been a blessing, Skane. You know, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to see my kids. You know, just see them grow. They, they've been asking questions, and and we've been hanging. We've been throwing football outside. I got, you know, I've been so. Uh, motivated during this time that you know I, my third floor i just demolished the hell out of my bathroom so they've been helping me put putting it together and stuff like <laughs> oh, that. oh you're going down on man <laughs> you know we're just you gotta call figuring, murphy we're yeah we're figuring things out <laughs> and um it, it's it's been cool it's been cool it's it's been a good thing you know i've been very mm -hmm. happy to see these kids grow and you know you yeah. know they all love you know it's it's a, it's a blessing oh yeah they made out of gold, man. The Lord put yeah. a blessing on you. Amen. You know, they and gold I'm, I'm a blessed daddy to have them. You know? Yeah. yeah, you know, we all love when they come on the gigs, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ruined my back for a whole summer trying to pick Kiko up when he was 13. <laughs> <laughs> the bouncing house we got into? Woo! The bouncing house, we were jumping up and down. Oh, man, you remember that? <laughs> we're aching the next day. Man. So, you know, uh, look, I want, I'm going to go over to Camille. Camille, you have a degree in in geological and environmental science. And you also have a community consciousness. And you know, this is a time that cries out for community and protest and that type of consciousness, but there's not really a lot of that in jazz today. We were actually looking for this season to be that. So we were looking around for who's really talking about it. And even if they're negative against us, go get them and just put them up here. And we didn't find a lot of people. So, so in, in, this, in this time, how can we as musicians continue the legacy of Max Roach and Abby Lincoln and Nina Simone and Dave Brubeck and, and, and all the musicians who were really about American social justice and use our platform to connect the community and battling social injustice? And do you even think we should do that? Well, I mean, jazz in itself is, is based off of speaking out, um, fighting for and advocating for what's right. Um, Nina Simone had a great quote that she said that it's the artist's duty to create music that reflects the times, that reflects the community. And as musicians, we are part of the community. Our canvas is what we see around us. And we're able to feel and be able to use the music as a medium to connect those thoughts and those feelings of what's happening in our world that we see with the people that we commune with every day. So yeah. even if it's just simply writing a song or even if it's simply starting a conversation or even if it's simply getting together with another um artist in a different medium whether it's through visual art or dance it's always great for us to use our music to be that voice and speak out i know with the things that was happening the last couple of weeks for me i didn't even have the words and i found mm -hmm. myself back at my instrument and mm -hmm it started flowing for me because it was like, okay, now I, I could hear what I'm feeling and try to communicate that. And I was able to put something together and start a conversation with people that I normally don't even really get to talk to. And I think we, we can, as musicians, use our music to, to start those conversations. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's kind of, that's kind of like what Elliot was saying, just with people. But, you know, I know from talking, I, I know from talking with you kind of the depth of your intelligence and also the depth of your engagement. And it's in your singing too. It's in your composition, it's in your singing. I'm, I'm saying it's just the absolute truth. Okay, I see you smiling, but I mean, because if people don't really know you, they don't understand. You know, they're not around you. They don't get a feeling for the, the depth of your level of engagement with things. So are you, do you feel hopeful in this time? Or are you, do you feel depressed? Or what, what, what is your feeling? I feel hopeful because as long as there's a will to fight and to keep pushing forward, it's going to get done. And I think as musicians, we live each day with the gift of being able to create. And that's a sign of life. That's a sign of hope. So we have to keep pushing and striving to do everything in our power to keep that light going. Amen. So I'm going to go over to Paul because he's also somebody who has a, a deep social conscious consciousness and a, a political awareness and is always uh, has, has a, a, a point of view. But I'm going to take him out of that. No, but you, you do. You know, I, I, I always tell people, we talk about these issues all the time. Ted and I have been talking about this stuff for years in a very raw and basic way because that's how we, we have to come to each other with that type of respect. But I'm going to take you into another thing. You know, I mean, Camille has expressed it for us. We don't need to reiterate what she said. But I want to know that what do you think about 
the role of technology in the music in a, it's changed recently, whether you know how to turn the phone on or not. I mean, I know how to get on my phone. I never knew how to do it. And um, how has it helped or hurt education uh, and other, other ways that you have to communicate a feeling to someone specifically as the technology helped or hurt in, the, in this isolated period? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a tool. And I, and I think it's like, we're able to do this now, which is great. It's just great to be able to hear everybody's like point of view, hear everybody play from time to time, you know, and, but, um, you know, I think I'm a little bit in the minority sometimes in just the way I feel about some of the advancements, you know, social media and sometimes even what we're doing where um, that, that tool can be used for good, but, but sometimes not without the consciousness of what we're using it for, right? I mean, being able to have these conversations, be able to do the projects we're doing, I think is great. And we're, we're chasing that live feeling that we miss, right? I mean, I love playing with you all so much that it's like, you know, just to get that taste of it is a little bit, but we're, we're always just chasing that feeling. So I'm hoping at the end of it, what we really do is just like running out the gate to get to the real thing again. The mm -hmm. only thing I, I feel like is sometimes we, we, we're like, you know, we take advantage of what we can do with technology without actually thinking of why we are doing it. Um, and that, that same thing goes with playing of like, you know, why make, make choices when you're playing of why are you doing this? Sure, you can play a lot of notes or sure you can do this, but, but what is the purpose of doing it? We can, we can fill all the stuff on the air, we can put something out, but I think it's all just this, uh, we're all just approximating like the real thing. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as when, when we can actually play together, we don't, let the, the simulation never try to overshadow the real thing. I'm never mm -hmm. going to get that same feeling as I get just sitting in the same room with y'all. That right. sound, you know, like Dan was saying, it's just, you can't even come close. It doesn't matter how good the equipment is, records, whatever, you know. So, so I, I want to go, for, I want to pick up on what you're saying. And I want to go to, for me, one of the great joys is to, is to look at you over these years, look at Walter. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because you, you're much younger than us, so... When you would, and Walter's young, a lot younger than me, so just you, you sit next to Walter. So early on, I would always love kind of just how when Walter played, because you're much closer to his sound than we are in the trumpet section. And just to kind of, you know, you can't, you can't fake like you, like something is hitting you. It's just something in music. And I'm gonna go with what Camille was talking about. How she said the emotion is so deep, she couldn't, she couldn't say she could reach for a horn. And uh, when you, when you reach for your horn, the, the the, the music is so invisible and so deep inside of all of us that it's, it's something that once you learn how to speak this language. So I'm gonna go to Walter because like Elliot, his mother and father are both jazz musicians. And, and he also is of all of us, he's like a people person. So in this period, I was thinking about Walter always talking to people, always speak a bunch of languages, is always like out there. And I'm always thinking, man, this has got to be hitting Walter hard. He's like our ambassador. And I want to speak to him first specifically about his sound because he has a sound that's so so touching and present. How, how has your has your sound changed in this time? And then I want to ask him, what things are you doing to help address uh, the pandemic the pandemic's effect on your sound and your creativity, Walter? Yeah, you know, um, many times, you know, it's interesting how when we go through our searches in life for whatever it is that we're looking for, and in this case, looking for my sound. Um, when you find whatever it is that you're looking for, you discover that it was always there. And so my, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I just, uh, that's who I am, you know, and thank God that we all have that beauty. I think that's one of the most interesting things about jazz is that in addition to the importance of teamwork and collectivity is the ability to express yourself as we're all different saying in different ways. Uh, individuality is, is also a part of that uh, group effort. And um, I think, you know, my sound, like uh, all those different things, like over the years, those long tones and exercises and things that we've been playing together, <laughs> Winter, when I come over your house, you know, all your food, you know, and, and uh, working on different things to develop uh, being present and stopping and taking a moment to just be in the moment and accepting oneself for what it is with yeah. the idea of improving, you know, even if we're not all perfect, but we are human. And that's that kind of human connection, I think, that is so special for us, particularly for me, considering um, this pandemic. You know, it's a real challenge sometimes, as, as all of us, you know, sometimes you feel like, man, I don't know what's going on. The new One day I'm hearing one thing, when are we going to open up again? When am I going to be able to perform? 
So some of the things that there's about four or five different things. Well, there's a lot of things, but I want to share with you just a few things that I find really helps me. Um, the first and most important thing I've discovered recently is to wake up and just say, today is going to be a great day. It makes a big difference. Because sometimes, you know, I'm worried about the future and, and, and how to keep creative and, and how to keep looking forward. And um, sometimes, you know, you got all these thoughts. It might make me uh, not sleep well or go through different periods where I'm trying, worried about the future. But just with that simple vibration, today is going to be a great day. It's like setting off on the right foot. And it makes a big difference for me, um, as well as looking forward to, like, enjoying the moments during the day that, uh, that bring me happiness, you know. And it could either be a simple or a profound thing. It doesn't even matter. You know, something like, uh, especially in New York, that we all – are inside with the virus and quarantine. I've gone, by the way, I've gone through quarantine since the end of January when we were in Shanghai and then coming back to New York for quarantine. It's, it's just, you know, you can go stir crazy, but even just going in the park or sometimes just enjoying the sunlight uh, in any way that I can, that's really healthy and safe and, and good for vitamin E. That's really important part of my thing. I definitely think exercise is an important aspect of combining our forces with this profound discipline of music, which is good for the body and soul and mind. And um, so I try to exercise and that really helps too, you know, and it, no matter how short or long, just something that's kind of consistent, that helps keep my good feeling and energy flowing and it helps my creativity too, you know? And so um, I've been doing a lot of writing <clears throat> You know, things like that. It really helps me writing about stuff and just my thoughts and reaching out to people is so important. And during this time, uh, talking about being present, just reaching out to those people who, uh, who support me and that I also support or may need my support is really important because, as we all know, we're so connected. And in the music, that's exactly what we do. That's why I miss playing with you guys so much because, you know, every night that we go on the bandstand and play, it's a profound sense of a connectivity that, um, that, that is a good example for everything that goes way beyond the scope of music. You know, individuality coming together, uh, uh, sharing, you know, spontaneity, uh, this music that's based on improvisation. All those things really help me to keep my creativity. And then one of the big challenges that, um, that really it's interesting and, and I like a lot is that so when I'm practicing by myself now, since we can't really play together in the room and hear the wonderful vibrations, um, it has really helped me in a way um, because it's a more, it gives me a more sense of being creative on my, my own and independent without necessarily relying on Carlos or Dan, or, you know, the, the backgrounds of the orchestra or different things that we're doing when we're playing in different uh, uh, groups and stuff. So that really helps. And I hope that when we get back together, too, that will help me to contribute more to our efforts. When we have our picnic, I can bring something to the table. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, 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 I want to ask, I want to ask Kenny, because Kenny also is a always looking for some positives and, and it's such a struggle for musicians mm. you know we all know you talking to your friends man it's no gigs it's, it's like from a financial standpoint people really are struggling mm. and and uh you know you also come from a musical family and, and, and it, music and this kind of music is a struggle so are you seeing any positives uh from what has happened or something that you see that can happen as a result of the times we're in now? Uh, yeah, actually I am. Um, first of all, man, thank you for, uh, for having us here like this, Winton. And man, I got to say, it's so great to see everybody in the band. I miss you all so much. I miss hearing you. I miss playing with you. And it's great to hear you all speak so eloquently, man. You, you always, every one of you always inspires me so much. Walter, man, like, I mean, I can't tell you how much I appreciate <laughs> your words. Like, seriously, I've, you know, all, all of you. Thank but, you. um... We, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. I said we like it long as yeah. he's not turning around telling us we're not playing our part. Y'all hear that sounds? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have found that actually quite a few positive things have happened to me uh, during this time of COVID. Um, 
I have a nonprofit organization that I created back home in Las Vegas um, for jazz education called Jazz Outreach Initiative. And we had to, at first, I was really bummed out because we had to cancel a bunch of concerts. Um, we just got our Las Vegas Youth Jazz Orchestra off the ground, had six rehearsals and had to cancel it, had to cancel the kids' concerts. Like, man, we've been working for three years to get this off the ground. And um, my executive director said, you know what, this is going to give us a, a chance to really strengthen our infrastructure. You know, and so we focus on that. We got bylaws passed. We're expanding our board. We're doing all kinds of things to make it so when we get out of this, um, we're going to be that much stronger. And in terms of like the Las Vegas Youth, Youth Jazz Orchestra, we figured out a way to actually record them. And, and so they've been doing recording sessions like we do with Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. Um, and we're working on our third one now. And it's given them an opportunity to be in the studio, even though it's with their cell phones, it's not being in a recording studio, it's given them an experience that they otherwise would not have had. So the first tune we did was Marcus Printup's arrangement of the Wayne Shorter tune, Armageddon. And we didn't choose that tune because of its meaning or title during these times. We chose that tune because it was the kid's favorite tune to play. They love playing that song. So we recorded the bass or the drums first and then added the bass and the piano and then the lead voices. And that gives everybody, you, you, you send that to all the kids with the lead voices, then they start to understand what it means to follow a lead player on another level than they would have if they're all sitting in a room with all kinds of distractions. So the kids have actually gotten better. Um, we've, we've done three recordings. We're working on a third. We did that one. Then we did a Zoom table discussion, like a round table discussion with all the kids. And I brought in Marcus Printup. So we kind of, the, the kids got a chance to interact with Marcus, which was incredibly inspirational for these kids. And that's something that wouldn't have happened. Then we did Little Darling from the Count Basie Library, Neil Hefty. Piece. And we did the same thing. And this time we brought in Scotty Barnhart. And he came and did a discussion with the kids. So they got to you know, ask him questions. And that was super inspirational. And Scotty, in fact, we, we have this little 11-year-old uh, trumpet player named Kai. Um, he's been playing for five or six years already. Went and knows him. He gave, went and gave him a lesson. This kid is the real deal. Play. He can play. He can play at 11. Um, and so he played the soul on Little Darlin'. So uh, Scotty heard it and offered, said, next time the Count Basie Orchestra comes through Las Vegas, we want you to come up and play that solo with us. So it's creating an opportunity for a, a youngster like that to be able to actually, you know, have, get to play with the Count Basie Orchestra. Um, right now, the kids are working on their recording um, Victor Goins' The Business of America is Business, which is not an easy chart. I think we can all attest to that. That's some difficult music. These kids... They've been putting in their time, they're working on it, they're shedding it. They've been playing along with recording of the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra to work on it. And then Victor Goins is gonna come in and do a round table discussion with, with the kids on that. So these are opportunities these kids are getting um, that they would not have gotten if not for the COVID. And at the same time, the organization, we're getting more structure. Uh, we're, we're breaking into committees to do different things. And I mean, it wasn't long ago, I was on the road with Winton and you said, you, you know, you got your org chart together and I was, what's an org chart, <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's given me opportunities to help the organization grow and to do other positive things too. Um, you know, a lot of you have mentioned missing each other's sounds, man. And I miss everybody's sound. And I want to let y'all know I got a new horn, so I'm going to have a different sound when I come into the band. <laughs> oh, no. so I'm working on that too, and I'm excited about it. I'm real excited about it. So I remember one time. I can't say, wait to hear it. I can't wait. I'll just say one, one more quick thing is I remember one time being, being in the room at a Q&A that Winton was doing. It was filled with probably like a couple thousand kids. And Winton was addressing um, a, a situation and saying, you know, there's a positive and a negative side to everything in life. And Winton said it's, it's important to be aware of the negative, but focus on the positive. And that's a lesson that I share with kids all the time. I think it's crucial, especially in these times, because there's so much that we can focus on that's not necessarily positive. And, and it's sometimes difficult to find the positive, positive situation in anything that we do, especially when it's something really drastic, when there's something really difficult to deal with. But that's the time when it's important to really search for that positivity and embrace it because it's there. It's there. And, and you know, if we all do that, we're going to come out on the other side stronger than we were before. You know, I look at what Carlos is doing. You know, he's really embraced the technology and recording. He's got a whole studio set up at home with birds in the background and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing. I got my, my, my home rig set up and I'm recording from home. And we come out the other side of it. Things are going to be a little bit different. And those who approach it from a positive point of view, I think are going to flourish. I hope so. 
And I think it's important for everybody, just for our spirits, to, to really focus on the positive. So that's, yeah. Right. Well, one thing I want to tell you, tell Kai that we got a little trumpet player named Max in this too. All right. <laughs> He's going to be showing up on the basic, on, on basic, on the basic gig with Scotty and them too now. On the yeah. bass. He's not used to the bass. He's going to show no, up no, on no the bass. bass. No, no bass. No bass. <laughs> No. They show up on the base game. That's <laughs> <laughs> Randy Vogel well, just might get a gig if he does that. <laughs> <laughs> I meant no. to tell Walter something. I just went. I, I heard you yeah. on the radio today. Oh, really? That made me feel so good, man. Wow, <laughs> that's nice, man. I'm not lying. And, and, and Thank you, man. talking about sound, there was no mistaking who that was. Oh and yeah, that was just, it was. It was so great. I, that little connection with you just in the afternoon. Uh, was cool. I have to tell you. Thank yeah, but, yeah. I, I got to give a quick shout out. My mom is here. I want to say hi to my mom. Hey, mom. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> uh, hey, mom. Hi, mom. Yeah. All right. I want to. I want. I want to go back with with uh, with with uh, with, with something on the on the line of what what Ted Ted is saying because we all hear each other play all the time. We all have moments that we can remember hearing each other play, like that um um. Baby, it's cold outside solo that you played in front of your daddy in the Hollywood Bowl. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 the Ted played. And I want to say that in general, the last solo is every, at the end of the night is almost always Elliot. <laughs> and then some <laughs> Elliot starts to play. Somebody Have we figured out why that is? Why is that? Because, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I don't want to take that personally. Like, is it a, is it a trombone free thing or is it personal? Like, let's talk about this right now. <laughs> I don't know. It's the nature of the instrument, man. It's the nature of the instrument. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But when you start playing, people look around and say, oh, yeah, him. And you start playing all kind of horn. And they say, damn, this this guy can play. You know, so we've been thinking, we've been sitting up there all night, and he's been sitting there and has not played. So, but whenever we get to that last solo, that last person, we always are kind of like, okay. And uh, one thing before we open it up for questions, I want to just tell people about the thing that I love the most about the band, is that because, because you're only going to play one time a solo. Maybe you play twice. Sometimes you don't play at all. So, I mean, sometimes you, if the set this is not right, but so I love how we start to, over time, we start to figure out how, who has played and who has not played. So when you get two or three songs from the end, Chris is turning around, Carlos, we look at each other, we're trying to figure out how to make it possible for someone else to play. And I think that, along with everybody writing their own arrangements, created the greatest change in the band, the kind of collectivity and sharing that makes our, arrange, that makes our, our rehearsal so interesting too. Because we keep that same disrespect for each other, but now we get to disrespect each other's music because we did the arrangement. So I want to I want to thank all my, my my beautiful members for being on, and I'm gonna open it up for questions. And you know, based on the question, we'll throw it to different members. Hey, Vic's on the call too. I see him. Oh, Vic's Vic, there? Yeah, he's in there. Where's you Vic? driving? Well, before I open up, let me see what Vic is talking about. I think Vic. he's driving. Well, yeah, what's up, man? How y'all doing? It's good oh, to be here. Oh, all right. Be, be careful, man. Be careful. <laughs> I'm not going to look at the screen, but I've been checking y'all out. <laughs> you know, y'all. Where you going? <laughs> I'm going to New Orleans, man. You know, it's like the pandemic makes you remember what's important to you. Right. So I've been up since 6 o'clock this morning driving to New Orleans. I'm an hour away. And, you know, relating that to the band, it makes you remember what's important to you after 26 years of being with the JLCO, you know, we we took being on the road, not for granted, but as a thing that we do all the time, but not being on the road will give us a greater appreciation. It's gonna be like an awakening Hmm. for when we come back out there. It's an awakening for the world about the things we've been sleeping on. We've been, you know, uh, living off the fat of the land, so to speak, but now that fat has gone away. So now we have to come back and, and rebuild, but we can appreciate what we had so we can move forward and get to what we want to have. Mm-hmm. Sure, you're right. Yeah. All right, keep That's keep right. your eye on the road, man. <laughs> we we don't want to get accused of nothing. <laughs> 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 what questions we have? All right, let's get to it. Um, we've got a long list. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And I'll remind everybody just to, to raise your hand in the participants tab if you have a question you'd like to ask. Um, this first one is coming from Skylar Mendel. Skylar, go ahead. 
Hi, um, thank you so much for taking my question. It's really an honor to be uh, speaking with all of you. Um, my question is sort of two parts. It's about listening. And part number one is what's your favorite way to listen to music, whether it's like a certain format of recording or with a friend or in the dark or any of that, just, just out of curiosity. And then number two, as you're listening to music, how are you forming opinions about what you're listening to and how are you getting rid of those? Like, for example, um, I'll be listening to something and my friend will say like, oh man, Lee Morgan, he sounds really angry on his like solo break on Blue Train. And then I can't hear anything else except that. So how are you forming your own opinions about, about what you're listening to? Well, I'm out of listening. Who, who has the most kind of... Chris? Know who, Chris? Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Years of God. I don't know about Chris. all that. <laughs> yes, what, a, what about your format that, that you listen to because you you got super supreme ears well actually something that elliot actually hit hit me to um you know was listening to the high resolution files and you know, we, we all got caught up in this mp3 type of thing when it came out in the early 2000s it was like yeah we get the music yeah we get it quick and it's it's you know it's but it sounds like garbage just because a lot of information is lost on this so like wave files and and vinyl and all of that. If you could, you know, find the, the most, you know, the high, most high res that you can get, and you can hear everything, and um, get a sense of how deep or how you know deep the symbol is, or just how much breath is in the tone of somebody's voice or somebody's instrument. So um, that's a format that I'd like to try and, and, and listen to it most of all the times. You know, I've pretty much gotten rid of most of my MP3s. And um, in terms of what to listen for, um, I was kind of in that same boat where it's like something would always catch me and I'd always listen to that. But then, you know, playing on the bandstand or playing with my dad when he was, um, I know right now he's missing playing and singing with uh, with our group back at home, the Echoes of Joy. I know he's missing that like crazy. But, you know, just being up on the um, bandstand and playing with him, you know, you get to hear not just yourself, but you, you have to listen to everything. So it's like you have to listen to the bass, you got to listen to the drums, you got to listen to the guitar, you got to listen to the background singers, you got to listen to the lead singer, which my dad is for the most part, he's leading. And so I have to catch his cues and everything. So it's like you have to turn your ears and, and you know, it's always, it's just it's like playing a sport, like playing basketball. It's like the play is never over. It's like the, the moment is never over until it, it is over. And so mm -hmm. it's like you're constantly listening for one thing and constantly going to, to the, another. It's like for on the bandstand, for instance, with the JLCO, it's like I'm constantly listening for the bass drums and then the piano. And then it's like the certain things that Ryan Kaiser might do, Ali, that we have to pay attention to. Sometimes we have to do some cross-section things. We might be playing with another person that's not normally the lead, but you know they're always capable. Everybody up there is capable of doing that part. So. It's like you always have to just, you know, listen, not just for what they're playing, but how they're playing it. You know, there's always a certain thing and they might change it. And that's the good thing about jazz. Everything is human. So things may change it, not, not necessarily drastically, but like a little thing like here and there that might change that you might have to catch on to and latch on to. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that feeling that we, that we miss right now that you could get to, um, in terms of that listening. You just try to focus on one thing and then try to focus on two things. Like just listen to just the bass or listen to just the bass and the drum or just listen, listen to cool strutting. Listen to that whole record. And listen to the rhythm section of that whole record. Cool strutting by Sonny Clark. Just listen to the hookups that they, that Philly Joe, Sonny Clark and Paul Chambers had. Just listen to that the whole entire time. Forget about Jackie McLean and Art Farmer. Just listen to the rhythm section. And just feel the vibe that they get on, man. So I wanna I wanna go to the second part of the question is how do you how do you form opinions about what you're listening to and how do you evaluate what you're listening to while you're listening to it? So I guess I'll ask Camille. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's always great to listen to as many versions. if you're if you're studying a particular tune, listen to as many versions as possible. That's how you're gonna come up with your opinions, what you like, what you don't like. You'll hear differences as far as approach, like I'll never forget the first time I heard um, Tune Up and I heard Sonny Rollins' ver version of it. And then I heard Miles Davis's version of it. And it was just like, whoa, this is night and day. And the proximity of when they were recorded, super close. But these people had two completely different 
concepts in approaching the song. All right, let me check out another version. And then from there, you're able to gain information and insight to what the possibilities are, maybe what some people took as a chance, maybe what they didn't take as a chance, what you would have taken as a chance, all those great things. But I would just say start with something that you like and listen to as many renditions of it as you can and start going back and forth between the recordings. So I want to I wanna ask Elliot another addendum to that question because he was saying somebody would tell him Lee Morgan is playing this way or so-and-so is listening that way and you were saying you're listening emotionally to music a certain way. How do you, how do you, if somebody tells you something about music or you've been led to think music is a certain way, how do you, after years of listening, listen to something fresh or a new, with a new type of ear? Well, for, for me, I'm, I'm not trying to analyze it <clears throat> while I'm listening to it. Like that for me takes the fun out of it. I just <laughs> like to listen to it and enjoy it and then almost get in another gear if I want to try and understand it. But I'm not putting music on to try and understand it. I'm putting music on to, to enjoy it. And to, you know, especially if it's something the kind of people that we're all talking about right now, that can change the way you feel. You could be down that day and you put something like that on and that changes the way you feel. But if I'm trying to think all the time about someone's sound or about they split this note or what was that <laughs> harmony wise, or then I, I'm, I'm actually, it's, it's something that we try and not do when we're playing on the other end of it. Because if, you know, you can, there's so much going on, you just want to be, to almost have that free mind and not analyzing and trying to figure out well, no, this isn't a good solo. If you start thinking that while you're playing, then right. you, you know, you're, you're already going down that track. So it's, it's uh, trying to, to, to maybe just enjoy the moment. And then there's maybe times that you can bring that into your practice if you really want to analyze it and understand it. But that's only to help you hear it. So when you're actually on the gig, you're not thinking once again, you're just more in the moment and be able to hear it. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you for your question, Skyler. Thank you. All right. Next question is coming from Joshua Polion. Josh, you there? Hey, Josh. Hey, we can't hear you. I don't know if your microphone's working. No, nothing yet. I can come back to you. I'll give you a minute. Ties it. All right. Um, let's go to Caden Green. Hey, Caden. Hi. Um, Mr. Marsalis and the whole orchestra, um, I think I'd heard in this kind of early stages of the pandemic that you had said that one of the things that you wanted to focus on really was training your ear. And so I've been able like to put a lot of time into transcribing and kind of working with singing with the tune, singing without it, and then putting it on the piano. Like I'm working on a lot of bird right now. Um, and I was wondering like what other types of ear training or working on your ear uh, exercises or techniques, or even just like listening, maybe how, how to improve my ear. Well, I think I'm gonna throw that over to Ted Nash. He has great ears. He not only can hear stuff, he's an unbelievable reader and great musician, but he also can hear into the intention of other type of styles. So Ted, what can you? Well, I, I just was remembering a time that we had some, we had some uh, time backstage and it was a Carlos and Dan, and you guys were going to the piano and saying, all right, you know, this is a C. Now what's the next note? What's the next note? What's the next note? Yeah, that was a good one. We did that on the tour. We did that on the bus, too. We did that on the bus, yeah. too. Yeah. 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 for hours. And it was interesting because I think we get used to hearing, it's not about being having perfect pitch and saying it's a C. It's about the relationship of the notes. So we hear it in a context of a chord, or it's a dominant chord, and it's a flat nine, and that's the 13. And that's a, you, know, you start to identify the extensions. And it's, I think it's, what we did was such great, we were just kind of goofing around, but it was such great practice for really getting your ears in tune. And when we're playing on the bandstand, we want to be able to react. Oh, is that a 13? Is that a flat 13? Is that a, a sharp 13? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's only five altars. Go ahead. Oh, Six, God. seven, eight. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. <laughs> I did the <laughs> sense, you know, the singing and then trying to play like what one do you play, Caden? I play the piano. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was a great, uh, a great thing that um, someone said, to take a pencil with an eraser, and you go, and then you say, that's a six, right? Or that's a major seven. So you have to identify the intervals immediately, right? So you don't you try to develop because intervals are really important and helps put context into things. And so you just hit the C and then you just hit randomly a note and see how fast you can identify the intervals. It's kind of a fun little game, but you can get other people to do stuff for you. Play something like uh, have, have a piano player. I mean, it's hard now, but online you could do that. Have them play a voicing. Boom. Now you just try to, <laughs> try to hit it. <laughs> Boom. Boom. We <laughs> <laughs> had so much fun with that exercise yeah. backstage. Yeah, who started that? Was that Nimmer? I think so. I think it was Nimmer. Nimmer that was <laughs> you he take your credit for it if he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he started. But make make things fun. A lot of times we say, oh, it's work, man. I got to practice. It's work. But you can make games out of it and have a lot of fun and you'd be learning in the meantime. Right. Yeah. I, I want to add to that, too. I think the more variety of music that you listen to, too, the more different kind of soloists you listen to, you're going to have a broader spectrum of, of things that you can draw from Harm harmonically. You can see how McCoy plays on a tune versus how Chick plays on a tune versus how Barry Harris, Bud Powell. You're, you're just going to hear different, different, different har harmonic approaches just by listening to different people. So that's another approach, too. All right. Um, so Josh just wrote to me his question. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read it. Um, he said, my question is about Mr. Marsalis's book, Letters to a Young Jazz Musician. He talks about breaking the rules by creating more form. I wanted to know how, I wanted to know more about this and how to be rebellious by creating more form instead of losing form. Thank you. Well, that's a good question. I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer just so, and, and not take a long time. We have, a ten, we have a vision of what the future is. And that future is some computers, some robots, people going to Mars, some shiny silver object that goes somewhere, robots doing everything, everything being mechanized and more technological, things being more what we call out, things being more, more abstracted. That's our concept. Now, what if the actual new thing is not that at all? Everybody thinks that's what it is. So when they see it, what if the, the new thing is more collective creativity, more humanity, a deeper level of engagement with your neighbor, skills that have nothing to do with giving power over to robots? So when I said that about form, the whole question of being a rebel means that you break a convention. So if you have a convention that is what is called avant-garde, and now it's just a term, to break that convention means you're not avant-garde. So your relationship with all these terms is always, what are you in relation to what everybody else is? If everyone is the, the word liberal and you are not, they're all conservatives. If you are the word conservative, in terms of the word liberal, it means in, in, in terms of, I mean, in terms of the word conservative, a, a conservative thing is the easiest path or a thing that everybody is. I mean it in that sense, because there are many uses of the word conservative. In other words, when you, when you have the, when you have the comfort of the status quo, is when you're doing something everybody else is doing. So you want to be in that status quo, just well, what are the avant-garde people doing? I'm going to do this. Now, when you don't want that umbrella, that's when you're actually out on that ledge. So that's what I meant. And what I meant by form is, form is unlimited. And of, of everybody is on here writes a lot of different forms. I think, uh, I want to get to some people who haven't talked. So I'm, I'm going to get to Carlos. Because he, he writes music. I can pick, on, pick anybody here who's done interesting things with form. But Carlos writes interesting forms that puts a lot of different grooves together. So I would, he writes music that can be traditional. It cannot be traditional. He puts a lot of different elements in his music. So he exemplifies kind of what I'm talking about. So I'll just ask him in his piece, in, in the new piece that you wrote with Moses on the cross and, and, and those pieces in it, what was your concept of form on, on, on in that suite of pieces. Carlos. Well, you know, you got me? The free form is, I know it's internet probably. Can you see me now? Yeah. yeah. How about now? No. <laughs> okay. Um, no? Yeah. I form, I mean, form to me, the way I visualize form is it's more of an event in my in, in, in my life, you know, when I write music and I try to uh, perceive a certain uh, section of my life. I, I use form as a, a plot or a scenery or something 
that has happened in my life. And I don't judge it by a, a certain even number of bars or whatever. I just let sound dictate what I feel to that specific uh, situation in my life. Uh, Moses on the Cross was just a was a song that that you know that that just talks about uh, Robert Moses' uh, you know expansion project through the South Bronx, you know breaking up you know families and stuff like that. Um, and what I utilize, you know, and I'm always, I'm a lover for the blues, you know, the whole Duke Ellington concept of the blues is powerful, you know, that those 12 bars, those 24 bars are very powerful. I, I tend to, to, to try to continue that legacy, uh, even through Latin music, because I feel that there's some type of spiritual connection with the one, four, five. Uh, I know we have it, you know, there's an even amount of bars, but that one, four, five is very spiritual. And, um, you know, when I write forms, I try to, you know, I try to follow these uh, spiritual guidance and sounds. And um, and that's how I usually, you know, build up form. Right. I, th I think it's it's important, too, to go with kind of what Ted was saying, because form is also a matter of play. You know, putting things in a context. We live in chaos. chaos. Right? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, our next question is coming from Ivan Smith. Ivan, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about uh, what do you guys, when you're playing, what do you see? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visual artist, and I'm working on a piece now where I'm, uh, uh, it's a Thelonious Monk, and I know people can't hear anything when they're looking at it, but I like to convey what he sounds like. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And I'm wondering, what do you see when you're playing as opposed to what you hear? Well, I think I want to see if Elliot, Paul, and Kenny, we all wrote pieces of Crystal Bridges that was uh, based on some type of artwork. So I think you all have not talked. So I don't want to run out of time without y'all getting a chance. So maybe if, if, uh, if Paul and Kenny can go first and then Elliot can hold the caboose up. Yeah. I mean, sure. Paul, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul Kenny and Walter, my fault. Um, so in terms of seeing stuff, I mean, we based it on the artwork, right? But, but honestly, when I'm, I'm playing, I guess, I, I always think of in, intent, I guess, and just a, more of a feeling behind it rather than just some, you know, I don't really see like a picture or anything like when I'm playing. Some people have synesthesia and they can, they really see the color swirl, you know, I, sometimes I'm jealous of that. I wish, I feel like it would make it easier. But, um, but just the, the feeling that, that comes into me, that was, that was a really big uh, awakening when, I mean, Winton, you talk about that all the time, right? Really getting into that intent of whatever the composer or the artist is really thinking about. Um, that seems like the easiest way for me to actually try to get into some meaning into whatever I'm playing, um, if it's writing or playing or anything like that. So I guess it's, le it's less technical in terms of a picture so much as what, what that feeling evokes in me. And then how can I represent that with what I'm doing? But go ahead. For me, um, I don't really visualize pictures or, or colors when I play. I know some people do. Uh, for me, I, I, visualize, uh, I visualize it as a, like a scope or a, a shape of telling a story uh, when I play. Now, the, the opposite, like when we wrote pieces based on art, um, I was very, I, I actually hear music when I look at art. Um, like the, the piece that I, I wrote about, it provoked a feeling in me and, you know, it, it brought me to a certain place where I actually studied music that came from that place and, and wrote music based on the piece of art that I was looking at. Um, and I, I go to museums and I'll go, you know, I, I love surreal sections, you know, uh, uh, Salvador Dali is one of my favorites. Um, it inspires music in me. But when I play, I'm not necessarily visualizing um, art that way or uh, um, colors. I know there's a young trumpet player, I think I just read about him, he's gonna be coming to Juilliard next year, um, who sees colors in music. He's, he's very visual in the way that he plays. And I, I look forward to meeting him. Um, but in terms of myself, I don't really see it that way. It's, it's a different thing. I, it's more about the feeling and um, I think of improvising as spontaneous composition and, and creating uh, 
sound, di different soundscapes that I can build on and uh, create an overall arc and tell a story with. Walter? Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean, Kenny. I kind of feel very similar. Um, the only time I've actually seen something while playing that has affected what I'm playing is uh, playing with dancers. Um, we've also done another portraits concert where we actually played while they had, uh, they had slides of different artists uh, so we could watch the artwork while we're playing. When we did Crystal Bridges, I, I did it the other way around. It's not like I actually saw colors or paintings or shapes or anything like that necessarily when I was playing, but instead I took the shapes and the painting of uh, Romeo Beard and Sacrifice and used that to interpret it my own way of expression what my what I thought the emotions were. So I, f I think uh, I would say I feel more the emotions that I'm sure we could probably interpret in different ways through arts. But one thing I, I, I definitely appreciate because of your question is so nice in the sense that uh, whenever we combine different arts together, it's always creates something very magical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Question. Thanks for your question, Ivan. Um, all right, we're running out of time, but I think we've got time for one more. Um, and this last question is going to come from Estevan Otero. Estevan, whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. Um, hello, hello, Ms. Marsalis and the rest of the uh, orchestra. Hey, no. So I was wondering, so how many of you guys have uh, perfect pitch and secondly um, well it's a, it's, what's a good way to get better at, at theory because my theory is not great but I have I have a really good sense of time uh, and perfect pitch and you know, I improvise pretty well um, so but I really need to get better at theory because I'm not great with you know chords where they are just, I just need a better understanding so what's a good place to start Okay, let's first, who's the perfect pitch club? Chris, Marcus, Elliot. 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 Vincent. I think Camille. Ted. Camille. I don't. Ted has a yeah, real good relative. <laughs> well, Scan, you don't got it? Scan, you don't have it? No, no. You're not man, lying to us, right? <laughs> no, my brothers be laughing at me, man. No. I got perfectly bad pitch. <laughs> <laughs> a horrible pitch. <laughs> Who else? Oh, we got more. I know we have five or six. Who else? I think Ryan has it. Brenham. No, he Brenham. said it. Brenham has Brenham. it. Ryan has it. So, I think okay, Dave Robinson has it, too. <laughs> Christy, <laughs> Christy, Christy has it. Christy has it. Christy. Yeah. Christy, yeah. Right. Yeah. A librarian. Yeah. Okay, in, in terms of theory, <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> First, the first I must say, get get you a book of Johann Sebastian Bach chorales, one and two, and learn how to analyze those chorales. That's the that's Western harmony. Now, when you want to learn about jazz harmony, get the music of Thelonious Monk, and his songs are a distillation of Duke Ellington's music, and Jelly Roll Martin. Now, all of us have different things that we could tell you. Lydian chromatic concept. There's so many theories of music that are great. Now, I'm gonna give you another name of a book. This unbelievable book of, of actual harmony that you can just carry around and read. It's called right. Structural Functions of Harmony. Arnold Schoenberg. Schoenberg. That is Structural a book that's very harmony. simple. And the interesting thing about that book is when he describes where the altered tones come from, it's coming directly from a kind of Bach harmony, but you're gonna notice the notes that he identifies through the minor mode and the major mode are gonna be the flat nine, the raised nine, the flat five, the, f the flat 13, and the major seven on the dominant seven or the dominant seven on the major seven. It's gonna be the same notes that we use in jazz. So that's what I, but I'm sure other, other people have other, uh, other concepts. And Duke Ellington, that's, that's advanced harmony. Get called Chris Crenshaw. Oh, right. <laughs> he knows all the Duke's chords. Anybody else want to want to just say about about harmony, uh, the, from a theoretical standpoint? No. 
I'll throw in something. Um, to jump on what you were saying with strengthening your ears, transcribe as much as you can. And then once you transcribe, sit down and, and really try to work measure by measure, understanding the relationship of what's happening in the, at that moment in time with what that chord is. Start with the blues. I love Train Slow Blues because he has this idea that he builds like five, 10 choruses off of that it's just beautiful to witness to see how he grows and creates this beautiful story with just this simple idea. But at the same time, he's doing certain harmonic things that you can see, like reading a book just from looking at the chords because it's a blues. Also, I love George Coleman because when he plays, it's like reading an open book. And when you transcribe it and you parallel it to the chords or harmony, like take for instance, when he plays on Ciara, it's, it's very understandable. There's, there's several ways of looking and listening to harmony. I know because when you have perfect pitch, there's target practice where, okay, that's a C, okay, that's a D. But then there's like the shape where you gotta get used to understanding, okay, that color is a C minor seven, C minor major seven, okay. That sound has a flat nine in there somehow. So try to sit in front of the piano, and, and this is important, see if you can voice out one by one the voicing and close your eyes and see if by each note that you play within the voicing, you can hear and see the distance between each interval and the difference between how does this color become darker when I flatten it? How does this color become a little brighter when I sharpen it? And then of course, learn tunes, because you'll realize all tunes, they ultimately have pretty much, most of the popular tunes have the same formula. And it's just a matter of understanding that roadmap sonically of what creates a structure of a, of a good tune. And then from there, being able to hear and see those shapes so that when you recognize those shapes, you can go to playing them because you already are familiar with that sound and color. Great. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with one other thought to go with what Camille is telling you about harmony. Okay, the first is to understand harmony from a modal standpoint. Okay, modes and how they work. A mode, one mode Dorian goes to another Dorian. Phrygian goes to another Phrygian. One major chord can go to another major chord. It's the way Art Tatum plays a lot of progressions. Minor, 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 dominant. Try to understand the internal way that voices move. Because harmony is vertical and it's horizontal. It's like human beings in a relationship. You have your relationship with yourself in space, then it's me and Dan, me and Ted, me and Victor, Victor and, and, and Chris, Carlos, and we start to get all these relationships that at one moment they're the most significant thing and the next moment they're not significant at all. This is the root of the chord. Then the next time it's the major seven on a dominant seven chord. Then the next very next chord is the minor third on a major chord. You know, it's, so, so harmony is such an intricate in detail and natural way, like the way a group of people just form a circle naturally. How many times we've been standing backstage and we just fall into a circle? That's harmony. So get the modal understanding, understand the, the, the philosophy of harmony, which is things that change relationships all the time. And it, it, that there's no hierarchy of relationship, but they do progress in a certain way that implies a hierarchy and that it's endless fun and it's like math. It's a huge cycle, it's like the universe. It's like the heavens and the stars. It is a huge, unbelievable cycle that can be figured out mathematically in millions and millions and millions of ways. There's no one way to understand it. So I'm sorry if I went on too long in the end, but I love my members, my brothers and my sister. I love them so much. It feels so good to be able to say it and look at people and not have any hint of anything that's not, that's not real. And the depth of that love is very difficult to explain. It's been played out on bandstands and recording studios and parks, prisons everywhere in the world for years. And they are so for real about playing, rehearsing, doing stuff and handling their business. I'm so proud and have such a depth of love for each of them that I, I thank the Lord for giving me the opportunity to be on this earth and play with them for the amount of time I play with them. So thank y'all very, very much for for joining us tonight, all y'all here on, on the domain. Chloe and Adam, thank y'all. I know Adam is gonna close us out. I'm not gonna say anything else after this. I will see y'all next week and I will be on the phone with y'all on Thursday.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, bro. Thank you. Great. Get out of your mouth for me. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'd just like to offer a big thank you to everyone for um, being a part of this community. Um, Jazz at Lincoln Center is a nonprofit organization in New York City committed to entertaining, enriching, and expanding a global community for jazz. If it's within your means, please consider making a donation. Um, with that, I'd just like to say thanks to, to Winton and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra for your time this evening and your insights. Um, and we'll see you guys next Monday at 9 p.m. Take care. Thanks so much. Take care. All right, y'all. Yeah. All right. yeah. All right. Later, everyone. Thank Thank you all. All right, everybody. Right. Much love, y'all. Much love, love yeah, man. Hasta luego, papi. <laughs> <laughs>